We didn't put the tape down for the box. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So John will probably do some close-ups early on, and then it'll be all slides after that. Mark's got his gadget, if you want to. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, all. I'm Dave Vansarowski, WA1JHK. Um, we're going to talk about KeyCAD this morning. Um, a lot of us have, as, as Chris has pointed out, a lot of us have ideas about the perfect gadget we'd like to go out and buy somewhere and we can't. Uh, nobody's thought it up or taken the time to make it. Um, a lot of us have designed things on circuit boards. Um, you know, this is a, just a perf board. Uh, you go to Amazon and buy, a, buy 20 of them of various shapes and sizes and, and stick, uh, stick parts on them. And what you really want to be able to do is take the idea in your head and get one of these. This is the box that arrived on my, on my uh, front porch, literally flew onto my front porch last night. Um, the guy used it like a Frisbee. And uh, so these are the, this is my latest set of boards. Um, I got really interested in this uh, last summer. It's a pandemic. You want to learn something new. So this is the first board I did. And it started with a sketch, and we'll go through the process. I have a kind of a workflow that we work through. And you go from this, and then you put the parts on it, and you end up with one of these. And they can be various shapes and sizes. Here's the one that just arrived last night. So we're going to walk through the steps. You guys can do exactly the same thing. The slides that, that are available on the website, there's two versions. One is the slides. The other is the set of slides and the um, speaker notes. So you can actually follow along and do the, the same presentation um, for yourself. Do the same project and come out and order. And, and you, too, can get one of these blue boxes to arrive on your front porch. Um, there's lots of references. The, of places, and we'll, we'll talk about some of these as we go through the slides. I put the references up front. It's also at the end of the slide set to make it simple and easy. A lot of good tutorials out on the, on the web that we'll talk about. So we're going to talk about the anatomy of a circuit board. What is a circuit board? What are the various layers in the circuit board that uh, you need to be able to, to pay attention to? Um, we're going to define a workflow. Uh, basically, I'm going to show you the checklist I use when I'm designing a circuit board. We're going to walk through each of the tools. KeyCAD is, is a suite of tools. Starting with the main, there'll be a schematic layout editor, a PCB layout editor, and a number of tools for generating. We can, we can actually plot Gerbers. Anybody that's been around a while knows that Gerber Scientific used to make plotters. So the Gerber format is actually a vector format it was originally used for plotters, and the manufacturers picked it up and use it for circuit board uh, fabrication. So we'll talk about that and how to upload it to JLC PCB. This sounds like an advertisement for them, but I'm a fan, and I'll tell you why in a little while. Um, here's a circuit board. It's a really simple circuit board. It's called a two-layer board because it has two layers of copper. But circuit boards can be any number of copper layers, and they always have copper and dielectric in alternating layers up to about 30 is what most manufacturers can do. Um, when I worked for a major server manufacturer, we used to ha you'd do 26-layer boards. It was quite common with 10,000 parts on them and 100 power rails. Uh, you need that much copper in order to 
be able to connect that number of things together. We're doing some pretty simple things here. These are all two layer boards that I have here. The other layers that we'll be talking about are the front and back solder mask. And literally that's what it does. It masks the traces so that the um, solder only sticks to the pads where you're going to solder on the parts. So the solder mask is going to provide that protection. You can have back, uh, front and back silk screens, which is the white lettering. May not be easy to see here, but um, we'll have some, some other pictures. But here's an example of the solder, uh, the silk screen on the front. And there's some on the back as well. Now one of the one of the things we need to do is be able to connect components to traces either on the top or the bottom of the board. So uh, we need to tell the board fabricator where where to drill holes. So we're going to have a drill map. We're going to tell them what size hole to drill and and things like that using a set of uh, drill files. Um, and then there's also vias. A via is just a connection without a component sticking down through the hole. So generally it's a smaller hole. But in all cases, what they do is they drill through the dielectric, immerse this thing in a bath, and they plate the copper through the holes in order to make the connections that they need. So as we take the idea that we have in our head and put it into the tool, we need to start with a schematic. And you're used to seeing schematic symbols. We use them everywhere. What we don't see so much are the footprints. The footprints are what the PC board layout uh, tool is going to use. We are all familiar with dual inline packages, but they're surface mount packages. Um, I'm sure this is way oversized for here, but that's, that's 60 thousandths by 30 thousandths. That's how big that part is, an 0603. And they come in sizes from 0201 all the way up to some really big parts. Oh, they, oh, yeah, uh, 0105s is, is uh, even smaller, so it's, it's, uh, they, can, they can get pretty small. The workflow, so I, I developed a workflow, and I tend to, to click through this all the way from a hand sketch schematic, so I have some idea, what the idea how the idea is going to turn into a, um, the circuit board, all the way down here to ordering the board. And we'll go through all those steps. We are going to start with the hand-drawn schematic. I like to start out with an idea of um, how it's going to get wired up and what the layout, the board layout, is going to look like. If it's going to be mounted on something like this is on a carrier, I need to know that in advance because I need to know where to put the mounting holes. right? Um, and if I have any physical sign con uh, size constraints. For me, in this plastic enclosure, I knew it needed to be 72 millimeters by 137 and a half millimeters. So I could, I could start with that at the beginning. Other boards, I don't care what size it is, I just kind of pick something square. So on the right of my hand sketch, we'll see the schematic. And the design we're doing is going to be one of these. This is a breakout board. The breakout board takes this, in this case, a DE9 male connector and breaks it out to some terminal strips. If you go work on a mountaintop and you have to solder a wire to a, one of these uh, subminiature D connectors, no, none of us like doing that. We gave that up years ago. So instead, these breakout boards are quite available. They're available from uh, higher quality suppliers like Winford, and if you just Google it on Amazon or eBay, you'll find tons of them. Um, so we're going to design one of these. We're going to use this as our example today. So we, there's a, on a on a DE9 connector, we've got the top row has got five pins, the bottom row has got four. So that's what I show here. I'm going to take the top row, put it on a a five terminal terminal strip, and uh, the bottom row, I'm going to put on a four terminal terminal strip. Now, when I lay it out, I'm going to lay it out similar to this this product that 
one actually is, is the Chinese version from uh, Electronic Salu uh, Salon. Well, let's talk about the, the tool. First of all, it's pronounced KiCad, not KiCad. So I think in other parts of the world, they would probably tell you it's KiCad, not KiCad. So it's, it's like, how do you pronounce Linux? Uh, so we use KiCad here. There's the official site, KiCad.org. And um, the, here's the, the download web page. And look at all the variations. You were just talking about, wouldn't it be nice to have, is it Vera run on everything? Well, look at this. Windows, Mac OS, most of the, the Linux distributions, FreeBSD, or take the source code and build it yourself. So it's, it's really, truly available everywhere. What's nice is that the, the data files that are produced uh, are interchangeable across all those platforms. So I took a design from somebody that did it on Linux, opened it on Windows, worked perfect. This is the main screen. The main screen has got uh, a list of the project files on the left. It's, here's the path to the, the project, uh, the, the sort of the root project file, as well as the, the path to all of the files that are, are, uh, we're going to generate from this tool. And it all starts with that project file. The tools across the top uh, allow us to create note create new projects, open existing projects, um, and there's built-in zip tools for archiving and unarchiving tools. We're going to be using the schematic editor, and which is going to look like this, this tool, this icon. Uh, the next one is the, the s uh, symbol editor. We're not going to edit any symbols, but we are going to be looking at the symbols uh, as we go through the symbol library. Uh, KiCad has a very extensive set of libraries for both symbols and footprints. Um, footprints, by the way, are, you know, we'll be looking at as well or when we get to the PCB editor. And then we've got the, the icon for the PCB editor and the, the uh, footprint editor. There's also some support tools here. There's a Gerber viewer. Remember I said that we're going to generate Gerber files, and those will get used in manufacturing. But if the manufacturer comes back and says, eh, this doesn't look right, or if you end up with some problem in the manufacturing process, you can actually use the Gerber viewer to look at what you sent them to make sure that it's the right thing and figure out where in the chain something got broken. It's quite rare to have a problem like that, but not unknown. So the first thing we're going to do is create a project. We're going to use this new icon that we just looked at. We're going to click that to create the project. Type in a file name for the project. In this case, this particular sheet shows example. Um, there's a checkbox down here at the bottom. If you check the box and it's on by default, it'll create a, a directory with the project name in it. And all your project files will end up in that one directory. So now we're going to look at the schematic editor. The schematic editor is more complex. There's lots of tools. Uh, on the left side, we've got some mode selections. Across the top, we've got viewing and navigation. Like Viewing is like zooming in and out and adjusting the view. On the right side are the drawing tools themselves. And we're going to place, be placing some symbols, and we're going to be wiring them up. So across the top, we've got um, the, a, a Save button. We've got uh, page size. We'll be going back to page size in a minute. Uh, and then we can print or plot. We've got the usual editing tools, same thing you have in any other program. Uh, we've got zooming tools, but the scroll wheel on the mouse works just fine. That's, I rarely use these buttons because the scroll wheel does what I need. And there's a zoom to selection button, which I've, I didn't even know about until I wrote these slides. And uh, it's very useful. You just kind of draw a box around the zoom you want to zoom, and poof, it pops right up. It's very useful. Um, for larger designs, you'll have multiple sheets of schematics. And these 
icons or for, mi for mini uh, navigating up and down, they call it up and down, because they treat schematic sheets like they're hierarchical, but you can treat them flat too. So it's, but we're not going to do hierarchical sheets today. That's next year's class. That's 201. Um, so we're going to manage symbols and footprints. We're going to we we have icons that take us to the tools to create them. Um, to browse the symbol libraries, and I encourage everybody that installs the tools to go and spend some time browsing the symbol libraries. That's what this bookshelf icon is. There, you'll see when we when we get to selecting some symbols that it's really large. They, I think they update the library every week or every two weeks with, and remember this is open source, this is community supported. So if you create a symbol, you can ask them to put it in the library and make it available to everybody. And when I first did the design with this terminal strip on it, there was no 3D model, for example, as part of the, the library entry. I noticed yesterday that they added it. Now, there's, an, there's a number of icons used to process different elements of a schematic, and we'll be working through those. We're going to uh, annotate. We need to annotate the schematic symbols. We'll, we'll walk through that and what that means. Um, there's this cute little bug up here. That's not to insert bugs, that's to eradicate them. Uh, if you click that, it'll run a design rule check and it'll walk through the connections and make sure that you haven't violated any, uh, basically that you've connected everything up that should be connected up. And if you have an unconnected pin, you've got to define what to do with it. Um, before we can lay out the board, we're going to need to assign um, PCB footprints um, to the symbols. We need to associate them. So there's a, there's a tool that we'll walk through for that. We might need to edit some symbol fields. The only one really that we'll be paying attention to in this case is the footprint. Um, and you can generate a bill of materials right out the back of this too. The last, the last icon is to start the PCB layout editor. And there's a, there's a tool there for back importing footprint assignments. Uh, all that means is if you get all the way to the PCB layout tool and the symbol that you, sorry, the footprint that you associated with the symbol to start with, you change your mind, eh, instead of an 0603, I'm going to have to use something else. You can make the change there and then put it back into the schematic and all the data structures of this that are managed by the schematic tool. There's the usual menu across the top that's got the word versions of access to all the things we've already just talked about. Um, by the way, I want to highlight help. Two, th two important things about the help I, um, in each of these tools. The whole manual is part of the distribution and it's on your hard drive. So go ahead and click help. It comes up in a browser. You'll get the manual for, for that particular tool. So when you get to the PCB layout tool, do it again, because then you'll get the PCB layout manual. Um, and in each case, you'll get the hotkey list. There's, there's a bazillion hotkeys. Um, my plan is to add a stream deck. I don't know if you know what a stream deck is. There's one over there on the table we're using for video production. But to put the hotkeys in there to make it easier to uh, lay out the board and, and uh, lay out the schematic. I have a programmable keyboard at home. I took the whole left side and made it pr the, the hotkeys. First step, set the page size. How big is the schematic going to be? If it's going to be a small schematic, then all you need to do is click the page size, set the page size to 8.5 by 11. Generally, in this part of the world, A, B, C, D, and E are the, the page sizes that we're all used to using, A being 8.5 by 11, B being 11 by 17, and then there's C, D, and E. When we were doing servers, they were all D size, and if you print them 8.5 by 11, you need 
magnifier because you can't read anything. And so we used to plot D size schematics. Um, the schematic sheet is going to have information on it, like today's date. It's going to have the revision, uh, a title for what the board is. Wh after you filled in some title block info, you can uh, then click OK. And then the title block is going to come up looking like this. Here's the sheet down here, and I just blew it up so it's easier to read. And all that information you just filled in goes in there. These empty lines up through the, the top section, those were the comment lines that I didn't fill anything in on. Now the toolbars. Remember on the schematic editor page on the left side, I said there was the mode selection uh, icons. That's these. I use the defaults pretty much. Um, you can turn the grid on and off. Uh, sometimes it's useful to turn it off if you're trying to get a screenshot. You don't want all the dots on the, in the screenshot. So you turn it off, turn it back on. You can work in inches or millimeters. Um, I have switched my brain over to millimeters for design and circuit boards. Um, a lot of the parts are in millimeters, the tools in millimeters. Um, so, but you're, you know, it's your preference. You can, you can switch back and forth even. You can change the cursor shape. You either get a cross or you get a vertical line and a horizontal line full screen. And you can switch that on and off there as well. Um, you can change the visibility on certain pins of the symbols. Uh, and you can change the way the, the, the um, wires are connected between components. Whether you, you can go at all crazy angles or it's all horizontal and vertical. The right toolbar is where all the, the real good tools are that we're going to be using. The, the ones I've grayed a little bit, um, we're not going to be using today, but uh, you'll certainly have an opportunity to use them if you do a more complex design. Starting with select item, we use that often. For example, if you click and then you hit M for move, you can move a component across the, the schematic sheet. Um, if you drew a net on a really complex schematic, if you drew a net uh, from one component to another and it, you, it gets lost. You can click it at one end and tell it to highlight it. Actually, you do it the other way. You click highlight and then you click the net and it turns purple so you can see it right, go right through uh, your schematic. Make sure it's doing what you want it to do. Placing symbols. We're going to place a few symbols today, so we'll be using that one. Because this this uh, breakout board doesn't have any uh, power on it. We're not going to be placing any power ports today, but you can, it's, you know, power, plus five, ground, whatever you want. Um, we're going to be wiring it up, so we'll be placing wires. And on complex designs, like if you had a microprocessor and you had 12 address lines going from the microprocessor over to a memory, Running all 12 of those wires across a schematic eats up board space really quick. So they support buses. And uh, so this is one of those buses. And then they have entries into the bus, uh, wires into buses, and buses into buses. And then there's a no connect flag. If if you're hooking up a component and it's got some pins that you don't want to use, you can leave floating for whatever reason. The checker is going to say, well, you didn't hook that pin up. Well, this tells the checker, it's OK that I didn't hook this pin up. You're, it's a promise <laughs> that I did it right. Okay, So that's an important one. Um, if you have two wires crossed and you meant for them to be connected, you can tell them, I want to connect this. That's what the junction is. And you can label nets. And then the rest of this is pretty much for hierarchical designs or multi-sheet designs. So we're not, we're not going to be working with those today. We will draw some graphics lines. Uh, yeah, that's on the circuit board. We probably won't do any on the schematic. Uh, but you can place text, too. And you can even place pictures. I don't know if in the close-up you saw, I've got an icon on here, JHK Labs. And that, that is a picture that that I just uh, stuck in there. And you can, of course, delete stuff. You can use the delete button, too. I'm not sure why there's an icon. 
I just used the button. Um, so now we're going to find some symbols. We're going to go through the library, and because of what we're designing here today, there's three connectors, so we're only working really in one category. Um, remembering the schematic, so the schematic on the right has a DE9 male and then two terminal screw terminal strips of two different lengths. And here's some examples. Um, two different vendors with two different uh, sort of styles. These guys used um, PC board mount connectors, but, but we all, you have these DE9s, they're on the end of every serial cable we ever have for a PC. And they just generally have solder cup, uh, they call them solder cup uh, wire connections on the back. Um, so what we're going to do, that'll be a good close up, we're going to straddle mount. You actually take the uh, circuit board and slide it between the two row of pins, and it fits perfectly across a 16th inch board. 1.6 millimeter board. So that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to use some of these terminals. And here's my quick picture of a of straddle mount. So what we're going to do is place start by placing symbols. We're going to start, we're going to place the, uh, yeah, we click place symbol, then we click on the sheet. That pops up the dialog. And this is the library selection. There's also a library browser, which is w much more complex. And if you're just grabbing a cup of coffee and wandering around in the library looking for what components are in the library, then use the browser. But if you sort of know where you're going already, then this, this is quick and easy. So we're gonna only doing connectors today. So we're going to scroll down to the connector category in the library. We're going to find the DB mail connector. Notice these are DE9 mail connectors. Whoever named the symbol in the library did it wrong, but you've got to use what they say. That's a DB. A, the letter B determines the shell size. This is an E shell. Just like a VGA connector is also an E shell. A DB is the 25 size. I, I don't have one here, but a, a B connector is, is long. So. Just one of my hot buttons, thought I'd point it out. Um, everybody in the world does it wrong. So that is the symbol we're going to use. So what we do then is we click on it, and it shows you the symbol. So you can see that it's it, what you were expecting. It, in fact, is a D shell with, a, with nine pins. Um, Review it, make sure it's the one you want, and then click OK. Now you get to rotate it. So before you actually place it where you want on the sheet, you can rotate it. And you click R, and you're starting out with this first one. And the, the first uh, position has all the wires off the left. The first R, they all go up. The, the, whoops, the next R, they all go off to the right, and one more would take them down. We want it off to the right. That's how I sketched my schematic, so that's what we're going to do. And then we go back here t t for the terminal strip, and we, we're still in the connector section. We scroll down to screw terminals, and there's a 1 by 5. Um, we click OK, and we place it on the sheet. Or we, yeah, and um, the wires are coming off the left side of it. So we uh, so that'll wire up cleanly. Click OK. And now we end up with a schematic that so far it looks like this. We've got the three symbols on it. No wires hooked up yet. I don't know if you can see all the little dots. That's the grid that I was that they give you to draw to. By the way, they like to 
creates, there's a, there's a symbol creation guideline that says every one of these connection points ought to be on a, f on a 50 millimeter grid. So you, um, if you create your own symbols, you ought to do the same thing. That makes them all compatible. Um, and then we want to wire it up. So what we do, we click on the place wire icon. Um, and then we click on the start bubble. I'm calling these things bubbles. That, here's a zoomed up picture of it. It's just a little spot. You really got to click the middle of it. Otherwise, the wire is not actually hooked up. Uh, so we're going to go from pin one of the DE connector to pin one of the five terminal connector. We said one, two, three, four, and five are going to go here. Six, seven, eight, and nine are going to go down here. So we click there and here. And the tool sort of has a mind of its own about where it wants to put this transition uh, from one uh, area of the board to the other. It wants to be vertical and horizontal. So, uh, But you can click one of these corners and position it exactly where you want to get the, the schematic all uh, put together the way you want. And that's what I ended up with. Not very pretty. You could delete them all and start over again after you come up with a prettier way to, you know, it's all aesthetics. Functionally, it should work fine. And we're going to, oh, and that's, and the next thing we're going to do, notice these question marks. If you look at any schematic, there's reference designators on every component. J1, J2, J3 is what we're going to want to do here. So we're going to now annotate the schematics. We're going to use the annotation tool. And we're going to click the annotate icon. It's going to pop up this dialog. And you just click annotate. There's a whole bunch of choices up here. On complex designs, you probably need some of those. But for what we're doing, just click annotate. You'll get it. it you'll see. It's going to be numbered J1, J2, J3. And that, that works fine for us. Now we, now we run the electrical rule check. Did we wire it up? In other words, did we connect all of the pins over here to all of the pins over here? Did, we leave, did you miss the bubble? Right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to find things like that for you. So we click the electrical rule check icon. We get this dialog. It hasn't done anything yet. All, it, all we did so far was pop up the dialog. Now we click run. And run is going to um, run the rule check. It's going to show you what it did. And we're going to check the error list for errors. In this case, we're not seeing any. Now, what if we hadn't annotated? If we hadn't annotated, it, you would have got a message here warning you that annotation is required. It's funny, it's not in red. They probably should use red text or something. Um, so you can, uh, you could, in this case, you would click close, and then you would go back and run the annotate tool, annotate the connectors, then come back and run the design rule check again. Um, here's an example of an unwired trace. If you, oh, you hooked up one through eight, and you forgot about nine, you got, took a phone call and came back, hit design rules, oops, didn't do it. It shows you where the connections are, but even better on the schematic, it puts a little green arrow exactly where the problem is that you need to resolve. So for example, if you hadn't hit the bubble quite in the center, it, that's where it would put the arrow, is right at the, the missing spot, so that you know that you need to um, fix that problem. Notice how I've, I've, I've had a couple of pictures here that I've zoomed way up. You can do that, and you can do it while you're in the middle of, of uh, running wires. The scroll wheel is always active. So if you're, you click and you, you got the wire is following wherever you're pointing, you can zoom way in. You can um, get to the, bu where, 
you can you can zoom way in on the bubble, the let's say the destination bubble, to make sure you hit it dead center, and then zoom way out again. Um, if you go way back to the the zoom tools that are on that top toolbar, F1 and F2 are the zoom in and zoom out. So frequently when I'm running a wire, I'll zoom in while I'm getting the wire where I want it, and then I'll zoom out again when I get done, just using those two keys, even without using the scroll wheel. End up with scroll wheel finger, finger sometimes. Um, so we're down to associating a footprint with the component. We have a tool for that. Click Assign Footprints icon. We're going to associate a particular footprint with the schematic symbol. So think about it. If, if you're doing through-hole components, like I've done on, on these boards so far, um, a through-hole component, like a resistor, is going to have th three-tenths of an inch of spacing between the two holes, and I'm going to bend the leads over and stick it through the holes. Or that same schematic symbol of a resistor can be used to specify an 0603 service mount component. I need to tell the tool which of those footprints it should use for that resistor or that capacitor. These happen to be T1 LEDs, 3 millimeter LEDs. Here's one over here that's a 5 millimeter LED. I had to tell it, in both cases, the, the schematic just shows an LED symbol. Now I need to tell it what size it's going to be. So that's the reason we, are f we have to go through this step. Things were so much easier 30 years ago. Um, so first, we're going to select the, uh, the reference designator for the component that we are going to, to pick the footprint for. Remembering the, the library category where you're in connector D sub in this case. Um, and we're going to use the footprint called edge mount. Okay, that's the straddle mount. That's going to be the straddle mount that, that is, goes along the edge of the, the circuit board. So we double click that. It, so let me back up. What the double click it does is it takes this name from here and sticks it up here in the center area. It hasn't done anything else yet. That's all the, the double click does. Then we're going to switch to J2, which is a, a terminal block. I did some research and I figured out that this Phoenix block is a three and a half millimeter based screw terminal, which is the size that I've been using on, on my boards. And so I, I double click that, and then we go down to, the, and that was the one by five, and this is the one by four. They're really almost side by side here on the list. We apply those to the schematic and click OK. So this is, and just to summarize, this is what that, I, all I did was I expanded that center section so you could see all the words. Um, you can see that for the the DB9 mail in connector D sub, this is the footprint I've selected. And these are all, this information is always available. You can go back and reference it. When you generate the bill of materials, it'll also help you figure out what part to buy, because you don't want to buy the, the 3.81 millimeter screw terminals, because they won't fit in the 3.5 millimeter spaced holes you got to buy, you got to know what parts you have. In fact, one of my favorite tools, now that I've been done a few boards, is a nice pair of stainless steel digital calipers. I, in fact, I brought them. I just forgot to bring them over here. Um, they're like 35 bucks on Amazon for a really nice pair. And uh, my f probably my favorite thing, how, how big a hole do I need for a 632 screw, right? Um, I can read it out in millimeters and make it a little bigger and place that hole on the, on, uh, or, or how big, I've got these 30-year-old 0.1 mic capacitors. What size hole do I need to put the lead through? 
I can measure the lead diameter because I don't have a data sheet. I don't know what they are. Now, in order for the for us to take the, the all that information that we've put into the schematic about all the symbols and about all the pins on the symbols and how they're all hooked together, we generated a thing called a net list. A net list is those that list of components and those interconnections so that the PCB tool knows what, what we're working with. So when you click the net list icon, you get this dialog. I always use the defaults. I've never had to choose anything else. Notice there, there's some PCB new is what they, t they call this PCB layout editor. Um, I see ORCAD and CAD star and SPICE up here too. Um, the, uh, and then we just generate the net list. Um, it wants you to pick a name for the net list, but what it really does is it takes the project name that we created way back in the beginning. This, I switched projects on you, yeah, now it's called demo example. And we just use demo example.net as the name and uh, click save. Now let's talk about, okay, so what we have now is we have a net list and it's got all that information in it. It's got all the information about the symbols, all the information about the footprints and how to hook it all up. And now we're gonna look at the layout editor and how the layout editor is going to uh, consume that information. So we're going to run the layout editor, and you can, you can click start in the schematic editor or on the main window. It's the same icon. Oh boy, even more tools. This, I think it's got twice as many icons as, as, the, uh, as the schematic editor did, and there's, there's a lot to do here. We're going we're gonna to narrow it down to just the few that we need for our first board. On the left, we have the mode selections like we did before. Across the top, the viewing and miscellaneous tools. There's another little auxiliary toolbar there I'll, I'll show you. There's, there's the uh, drawing tools down the right. And then way to the right, that's called the layers manager. We'll, we'll spend a little time talking about that. The top toolbar, really similar. There's a couple little things that are different, like the uh, you can select which, which layer you're looking at and some things like that. Um, I think these are identical to uh, the schematic layout editor. Um, and there's a whole bunch more modes that have to do with PC board layout that are very well documented in the manual and we're not going to be using today. Remember, this is supposed to be a quick start. <laughs> Uh, on the right toolbar, these are the, these are the drawing tools. Um, we're going to be able to select, we're going to route tracks. Those are the two we really care about. If you were going to add mounting, mounting holes, you, that would be add footprints. There's actually a mounting hole category. Um, there's a DIN rail bracket category. Um, these is filled zones. We're not going to touch any of that today. Uh, we are going to use the graphics lines. We're going to use that for silk screen. Remember, silk screen is the, the printed white stuff on the top of the board. And we're going to add some text. Uh, and we're going to measure some distance. The caliper tool up there is in extremely useful. I really like it. They did a nice job. The layer manager controls the display of each one of the layers in your drawing area on the screen. You can see there's a whole bunch of them. Not all of them directly affect the, the um, fabrication of the board. Some of them are just used for, like, like the courtyard, for example. If you overlap two courtyards, the, the, the rule checker will get you. It'll tell you that, that you, have, you can't place two physical devices in the same space, not, not, not in this universe. So, um, and the blue arrow, We'll be looking at the blue arrow several times. That's the layer that you're making modifications to when you do something. This is that auxiliary toolbar I mentioned. Uh, these are drop downs. Um, you can specify the track width of the, of the track on the board, the trace on the board. Uh, quarter millimeter, 
is uh, is plenty good. It's about 10 mils. Four is plenty good for um, regular signal lines like we're using. If you're going to do any draw any current, then you need to start thinking about one millimeter, two millimeters, three millimeters, in order to get enough copper to run uh, high current through it. Like if you're doing a power pole outlet strip. You can change VIA sizes. Uh, there's some auto track width selects and grid step stuff. I've, I do use the, the grid drop down from time to time. Um, that's a snap to. In other words, if, if you, the finer you make the grid, the more steps you have in placing uh, the traces on the board. So we're going to import the, the net list, click the net list button. It's the same icon. Here it happens to load over in the schematic editor. It did the store. Uh, select the file that you want to uh, load. Click open. Uh, you get a you get a load status. Should all be green. Um, update the PCB and close. And this is what you get. Looks awful. Remember. The information given to the PCB layout editor was it knows what the components are. There was a DE connector and two terminal strips, and there were connections between them. That's all it knows. It doesn't know where to put them. So it gives you this. This is called a rat or a rat's nest. And our, what we need to do, and this is in our case simple because there's only three parts. Imagine 10,000 parts. And you need to figure out which group goes down in this corner. Um, we are going to press M and move each one of the parts after we select it. And then we're going to R to rotate it, get it where we want it. Remember, we're, we'd like it to look like this. I'm not sure I really care which end is pin, you know, one. Should one be over on the left or the right or nine or six? whichever way the, the terminal strips go. But as I was playing with it on the screen, and this is where a live demo really helps, because then you can see the dynamics of rotating the parts. But if I took this and I twisted it around, these, these they call these air wires, because they they're not actually copper yet. They get all twisted up. And that means you have to change sides of the board and do things in order to get routed. So. I rotated it around until the wires just lay out nice and cleanly in both, uh, remember, one through five and then six through nine. Don't worry that these cross so much. Remember that the view here is always from the top of the board. I've got components placed, and the, these air wires are the traces that we're going to route. Now, remember what we said about the anatomy of a PCB. We've got front copper and we've got back copper. And the front and back copper um, are available to us to route traces. And now remember the layer manager. We're, we're going to select with the blue arrow which layer we're going to route traces on. Notice the colors. All right. Front copper is always going to show up as red, unless you pick a different color. Um, but Front copper is always red, back copper is always green. So when we look at that, we see that this footprint already has red and green on it. Well, that's because the footprint is, has copper pads on both sides of the board. They got red on the front and green on the back. And then I guess I could have flipped it. Hadn't thought of it. So we're going to make sure that we, we get the, the pads wired up to match. Um, these blue lines, uh, kind of turquoise lines, these, this is silk screen. This is front silk screen. And this white line, that's the courtyard I mentioned where it checks for interference. So they're being displayed there for us. And we can, we can turn them off. I'll show you that. Now, we don't have any mounting holes in this design. So, so we're going to skip that step. But we need to draw the edge of the board. We need to, now that we know sort of how big the board is, we need to draw a line on 
the edge cuts layer. Edge cuts tells the, the fabrication house how big the board should be. They also charge you by the number of square millimeters, so <laughs> you, you can optimize to a certain extent the size of the board and control your costs a little bit too that way. Um, this happens to be a 40 cent board, so it's not like it's a big deal. The, when, we, when we draw, we're drawing on the edge cuts line. Notice the color, right? It's kind of that putrid yellow color. And we also click to make sure that the blue arrow was on that layer because we want to draw on that layer. We're going to use the graphics lines to draw on the edge cuts layer. And we need to draw a line along the back of the connector. This, see where it says PCB edge here? It's kind of an eye, sh an eye sh chart, but we're going to draw a yellow line there and then finish the box. If you make the box crooked, the fab house will make the board crooked. So your choice, whatever you like. If you want notches and stuff, they'll do that too. But it'll come back exactly the way you define it. Um, and just, just to use the caliper tool, we select the caliper tool, click start over here and end over here, and there it is right there, 30.4 millimeters is how long that board ends up being. Move on to the Y. Click here, click here, 27 millimeters. So at JLC PCB, these guys, they have a $2 special, five boards for two bucks. That makes that 40 cents. Anything up to 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters, two bucks or five boards. That's why the voter two board, you know, it could have been four bucks, but um, the heads up is to get this box here, I have to pay DHL 20 bucks, right? So even though they're 40 cent boards, there's an overhead of 20 bucks. Now I happen to order 10 in this case, and it was still only 20 bucks to ship it here. I don't know what the weight limit is. Maybe it's, um, Maybe it's a pound. That was two-thirds of a pound. Um, I also ran a quote for 25 boards. Six bucks. <laughs> Which makes them only 24 cents a piece. So this stuff's free, right? So you educated yourself in a new tool, and then to just prove that you did it right, you order it, and you're only out 25 bucks. I remember the old days when we were doing this, and you had to do it with rub-on letters and all of the, the associated odds and ends, and you're trying to get the, the matching size exact with the copper. You're there with the copy machine with the, the, the expand and, and contract. It never, it never worked right. This yeah. makes it so much easier. Don was saying how you, you used film and you used rub-on letters. And are you mic'd up? Oh, okay, cool. Um, I dug this morning looking for a piece of film with tape on it, and I couldn't find one. I know I have one in a box somewhere, but I haven't used that technology since. I did it in the 80s. The 80s, it's, yeah, it's 70s horrible. and 80s. I remember the rub-on letters trying to put trying to put my call sign on there. And uh, this is so much easier. Yeah. 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 And with the chemicals, not, not to mention. The that ferric was just chloride and the Pyrex dish, and I mentioned the, yeah. Yeah. And how do you dispose of that stuff nowadays? So this is 40 cents. Um, OK, so we measured it. Now we got to route the traces. What we're going to do is click on the route track icon. We're going to make sure that we've selected the front copper so that we put, we already have these pads. These are, you can think of these as surface mount pads because they don't go through the board. You've got the red ones on the top and the green ones on the bottom and they're sort of surface mount. So we're going to use the red side to connect to these five terminals. And then we're going to select route again, but this time we're going to do the bottom and we're going to route on the bottom. 
So even though these cross, the red ones are on the top and the green ones are on the bottom. So not a problem. And now we're going to add some silk screen. Um, again, remember that we did the copper. The solder mask is, just sort of falls out of that. Where, where the pads are, they don't solder mask over the pads. They just solder mask over everything else. Right? There, you can draw on the solder mask layer to change the shape of the solder mask. Like if you wanted a great big square area that didn't have solder mask, you could fill in a blob there and it wouldn't put it there. Maybe it's for, for some special application. So we're going to, we're specifically going to draw on the front silk screen. Um, and what I wanted, what I like to do is I like to label my boards so that next year when I pick up the board, I remember what that ter screw terminal does. Um, there's a couple examples up here of that, if you can come up, come up and see it later. Uh, wait, I got one. This is easier to see. Along the terminal. Got it? Along the terminal at the bottom, you can see the silk screen. I drew little boxes and put numbers in them. So that's what I'm going to do on this board. I'm going to number them one through nine. So I started out with the boxes. I used the, the um, graphics line. Don't click the green track. Drink, uh, click the graphics line tool. And make sure you select the front silk screen. And then just zoom in and draw a box and some lines. Then you can put text in those. You click the, the text graphics icon. We're still on the front silk screen. Put in the text you want. Verify you're on the right layer. Don't be on copper. It'll literally go in the copper if you do it that way. Um, click OK. So I just went through and did 1 through 5, 6 through 9. And I also identified the board. Put some text on it so that we remember what we did and when we did it. And this is the finished board. That's it. We've got silk screen on the front. We've got the traces front and back. And we're all set. Um, we're going to run the design rule check on it. Click the bug. Click run DRC. It tells you all the different things that it checked to make sure that things are good. Be very sure that unconnected items is zero and that errors is zero. You really do want to make sure that those are correct. Because whatever you produce, the fabrication house will fab, and it may not work when it comes back. Click close here. This tool has a really cool feature called a 3D viewer. I love the 3D viewer. You click Alt 3, and up pops a rendering of the board that you just designed. If there are 3D models associated with the, with the footprint, this would show a terminal strip, and this would show a DE9 connector. So the library that I had on that day didn't have the terminals. I've since found, noticed that somebody added them. You can also grab this thing and rotate it on any axis. And all I did here was I rotated it around so I could look at the back. And here you can see the solder pads on the back, the, the back pads. They don't have solder mask over them. You can see the copper underneath the solder mask. Same on the front. You can see the copper under the solder mask. And you can see the, the uh, copper pads that the connector is going to slide on. Sorry. Ah, um, Willem's asking, um, one of the pads is square, what does that denote? Well, that's pin one of the device. I don't care. <laughs> it turns out that, that this footprint is symmetrical. So what I do is I just rotate the terminal around to whichever way I, I want it in that row of holes, physically. Does it 
Yeah. Um, I don't know if I. Um, I think it's always sh uh, must have shown up in the footprint. Um, we just didn't notice it at the time. But um, I, I think this specific footprint is intended, you can see there's a little notch here that's intended to be pin one. Once, once you solder down the physical terminal, you can't see the square pad anymore. So that's pin one. Um, it could be that, that this silk screen was designed to have the screw terminals come in from this side. And I want them to come in from this side. So uh, I didn't really worry about. Part of it has to do with when you take the footprint and you rotate it around in order to position it on the board. It doesn't flip. It just rotates. So if you want a symbol to be the other way around, you either have to find one in the library or design it. Um, so I, in this case, I didn't didn't bother. I just, in, for any of the, any of the things I have here that, that have terminals, uh, terminal strips on it, I just solder them down. Um, so this is literally this board, the LED board, and you can see that the library does have 3D models for LEDs, uh, resistors, capacitor, and if you look carefully for the DIN rail brackets on the back, and if I'd have rotated it around, you would have seen the DIN rail brackets sticking up off the back of the board. So when the models are in there, you can, you can really get a good look at what the, what the downtown area of your, your board is going to look like, uh, the way the parts all line up. Really useful. Um, by the way, the 3D viewer also works well in the... Um, uh, in the footprint editor. If you pop up a footprint and hit Alt-3, you can see what the footprint looks like. Manufacturers are very specific about the format of their Gerber and drill files. And this JLC PCB app note on do it this way, just follow, follow the rule. It's really simple. You click File, you click Plot, you specify the, the, um, the nine layers, which are the copper, paste, silk, and mask, front and back, and the edge cuts. That's it. Um, you can, by default, put them in the output directory. You click Plot, check that the files were created. These checkboxes should match what JLC says they should be. Then to generate the drill files, click the Generate Drill File button over here. Default the output directory, tell it to generate, make sure it did. Um, close the, the, I must have skipped one. Yeah. Uh, also generate the map file. JLC doesn't, says they don't need it, but it's a human readable version of the drill file so that if the production operator has a question about drilling holes, they'll just go read that file and see how it, what you really meant to have done. And you can close that, close this one. There is a viewer if you want to go read it or view, view all those layers of things you just did. I did once. I'm not going to do it again unless I have to. All the colors are all different and the t it's a diff somebody else's tool. Um, zip it up. I use 7-zip, so these 13 files, you need the nine that we talked about first, and then the uh, last four are the drill and drill map files. You go to JLC PCB, you drag and drop it right there. It'll give you an instant quote on what it's going to cost for your bores. If they're less than uh, 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters, and you only want five, it's two bucks. I thought that was an introductory price for a new customer, but it's every time. That is their deal. The list of references. I highly recommend John's Basement. Um, he has a 35-step playlist in his tutorials. 
and they're very granular. Each one is one feature. I highly recommend John's basement too. You're welcome to come over and take anything you find. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> um, also, uh, Chris Gamble at Contextual Electronics does, uh, does a good job with, again, very specific tutorial items. Uh, and even SparkFun has, has a set of tutorials on, uh, on KiCad. Um, remember the, the drill reference? And uh, for some background information on what the Gerber format really is, you can, you can go there. Questions? Head full? So, <laughs> maybe. So, so one thing about circuit boards is, circuit boards are always fabricated in a panel. And panels are like 16 by 24 inches. If they take a customer's design, remember you, did, you gave them the, the height and width, and they place it all on there, they end up with some extra space. That's where they put yours. It's basically the throwaway material you get to buy for two bucks. That's it. It keeps it out of the landfill. So that's the deal. Thank you. <laughs>